unfortunately, people want people are attracted to uh, the 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 churches where there's a, the celebrity pastor, yeah. the celebrity leader. People tend to be pa- uh, to attracted to those tr- those churches, and um, other than directing people to the, to a different value system, a biblical value system where it's not about us. Or worship is not about me. I mean, this, the dumbest, I have, my best friend said, the dumbest thing to ask after a worship service is, did I like it? Welcome to the Confessions of a Worship Leader podcast with Brandon Dempsey. Confessions of a Worship Leader helps survivors of spiritual abuse and those traumatized by toxic churches. Now, it's time to confess the mess. Here's Brandon. Welcome back, and welcome, if this is the first time, for you to join us here at the Confessions of a Worship Leader podcast. My name is Brandon Dempsey of worshipteentraining.com, and it is a pleasure to come to you and to have you join us into these conversations about spiritual abuse, manipulation, uh, twisting of scripture, all those things that we now have discovered in our life of church in 2022 and 2023, and how do we deal and grasp with these topics. That's the reason why we bring this podcast to you with great friends like great good friend, Michael Card sitting right here. And so if you are asking yourself, or you know that you've been in a place where you've been burned, damaged, discouraged, distraught, distressed, you name it, then this podcast is the right place for you. So today's confession, how does one worship amid spiritual abuse? So today's special guest stepping into the confessional booth is Michael Card. You may know Michael from being a recording artist, worship leader for 38 albums. He's authored 28 books. He's the host of a weekly podcast and has written for a wide range of magazines. Uh, he's penned such favorites as, as you may remember, El Shaddai, Love Crucified a Rose, and my favorite, Emmanuel. The popularity of his work seemed to be a stark contrast goal in his life uh, because he simply is a Bible teacher, but I look at him as a Bible teacher through song. He and his wife, Susan, and their four children, four grandchildren, they live in Franklin, Tennessee. Actually, they live like further out in the boondocks that we're not going to tell you where, Tennessee. And (laughs) each year he travels the country doing music and teaching. And um, Mike and I met back at a place called Lady Lodge in a town called Fredericksburg, Texas, about probably 10 or so years ago. Uh, And he's more than that. And he's been a dear friend ever since. So without further ado, let's welcome Michael Card. Michael, how are you today? Thanks for being here. Hey, Brandon. I'm I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Are you okay? You doing all right? You know, I'm I'm doing better now that we got all of our technical issues, my technical issues solved. I have. Well, yeah, the listeners need to know that we've been going back and forth for about 30 minutes trying to get everything to work. So it was another podcast. Yeah. (laughs) So so now we have the pleasure of actually doing this for real and seeing how it works. And uh, you'll uh, listeners and watchers, you'll be you'll have the verdict uh, if this podcast even continues and you get to the end of it. So, Mike. We talk a lot about spiritual abuse. Uh, I had a couple on yesterday, or actually just a, a young lady who I interviewed as well. And both sets of people told me that the church that they're in, that's driven by the pride of the pastor, this is spiritually abusive to them. And, and on this podcast and site, we talk a lot about what spiritual abuse is. And how it affects people. And basically, spiritual abuse is nothing new because it's been ever since the the day even before Jesus walked the earth. Now, I thought that this would be an incredible topic to hear from you about, Mike, because Mm. you teach on worship. You know worship so well. And a lot of people look to you for that encouragement, including myself. And then I thought, well, then how do we put this then in the context of someone who is really seeking God, who is really trying to live out biblically their life before him and worship him in truth and spirit, but they're having the difficulty because man is in the way. 
So how yeah. does one worship amid a spiritual abuse, Mike? Well, I, I think for a Christian, we always, our, our, our method, our, our, um, our, our mode of understanding everything is, is always to return to the life of Jesus. You always go back. Mm-hmm. And if anybody ever experienced spiritual abuse, it was Jesus. Uh, from the the powers that be, the Phar- mainly the Pharisees and the and the, the well and the priests, the people that were in charge of the temple, the very place where worship was supposed to be happening, they were his biggest adversaries, and so were the Pharisees. And and you look back at the life of Jesus, and I think he never let them uh, hamper. He never let them stand in the way of his worship of God. Um, it's almost like he didn't want to let them win. Uh, um, he was always faithful in, 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 in recognizing and celebrating the worth, the, the worth of his father, which is what worship is. It's celebrating the worth of God. And, uh, and so I, I, I always go back to, to Jesus life. What did Jesus do in the old days? We used to have these bracelets. WWJD, yeah. what Jesus do, um, and and so I, I I see that Jesus didn't let those people spoil it for him. And in my situation, I mean, I've been in Christian music for forty years, and especially in the early years, and 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 mm. and maybe halfway CCM. through, yeah, CCM. I was I was sort of I won't say I was victimized by that, but I was definitely I was definitely a second class citizen in the CCM world. Right. Because um, because I didn't ascribe to the same sort of formula that that uh, that were popular at the time. That's right. But um, I I think it it for me it had to do with I was well discipled by a guy named William Lane, and uh, Bill Bill didn't let his he was a, a an academic he didn't let the other academics spoil his worship life. Uh, b- with their uh, strictures, and Bill taught me that uh, in, in the same in the same context in Christian music. I just didn't let people spoil it for me. Uh, I, I want to um, stay connected to the Lord, and I'm I'm not going to let uh, someone else's formula, because sometimes it's very formulaic, sometimes it's very emotionalistic. Um, I mean, you you probably can articulate the the, the problems better than I can. But my determination was I was not going to let anything come between me and connecting with Jesus. And um, that has served me well. I can say in 40 years, uh, I've, I've not developed any bit bitterness. I think uh, it was a struggle for a while, but now I'm 65. I have no bitterness uh, for, for all those years yeah. and all those uh, strictures that were with it, that people tried to place on me. And uh, I mean, God was faithful. I, I I just did my best to stay connected to Him, and lo and behold, He uh, He was faithful. I mean, I'm always faithful. He's always faithful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I find I find that really interesting because you, like a lot of worship leaders and people in ministry right now, you had your own version of this doing music in CCM where you yeah. said that you have restrictions placed on you. You had to follow a certain formula, a certain path, yeah. walk a certain way, talk a certain way, have your own identity a certain way that was apart from who you were. And that's very much like what a lot of people are going through today in the yeah. church, the formulas that they're told to swallow. Yeah. So take us back. How, how did you handle that in your terrain back 20, 30, 40 years ago? Well, again, I, I, and not let I people go, confuse it for you. I, I go back to the fact that, I mean, completely, um, completely apart from myself, I was discipled by a remarkable na- man named William Lane. Bill was a biblical scholar. He wrote commentaries and that sort of thing. But he was also my pastor. He was also the fir- first person to ever ask me to write a song. I can remember one Sunday morning, Bill walked up to me and said, you play the guitar, don't you, Mr. Card? And I said, well, yes, sir. But for me, guitars were for, for attracting girls at the student center in, in college. I'm in college, right? That's right. what a guitar is for. I, no concept of worship. I had no concept of using 
those uh, those gifts for the Lord. That was all Bill uh, introducing that to me. Mm-hmm. So Bill just very very offhandedly said, "Here's my sermon for next for next week. Write us a chorus." And I'd I'd never done anything like that. Mm-hmm. And me with my uh, mixed motives because that's all I've got is mixed motives. Um, I, I'd love to say that uh, I want I heard the Lord calling me and I was spiritual and obedient and I, I followed his call. I didn't. I just wanted to please Bill, this professor that I so admired. And so I started writing music in the context of a little black church, uh, Cecilia Memorial Presbyterian Church in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And Bill would give me his sermons and I would write songs. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started. That was 19 or about 1980, 81. No, I graduated in 81. That was before that even. It's like 78, 79. Anyway, um, but it, it wasn't my faithfulness. It wasn't my spirituality. It wasn't my obedience. It was in spite of my disobedience and my lack of spirituality that God used me anyway. And so that and that was when CCM was in its I mean, it even before its infancy. Hmm. And so uh, what happened was I I, uh, I graduated and I was going to go on and teach. I wanted to be a teacher and, uh, like Bill. I wanted to get a Ph.D. and teach Bible study in a, in a secular university the way he did. And lo and behold, uh, Christian music started. And I had a friend who was a producer who wanted me to record these songs I'd written from Bill's sermons. And that's how I got started. And and lo and behold, there was this world, this whole world. And a song was supposed to be this and it's supposed to be this long. It's supposed to, you know, uh, connect with people at this level. And all I wanted to do was teach the Bible. I wanted to teach the Bible with the songs that I, that I was writing. And so I'm not really a worship leader, strictly speaking. Hmm. I'm a I'm as boring as this sounds. I'm yeah. sort of a musical Bible teacher. Yeah, right. Which is not as cool as being a worship leader like you. That's it much is. cool. No, uh, <clears throat> and that's not me either. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny um, to hear you talk because it's you have such a vast uh, experience on this topic about leading worship in the church and doing things that were outside formula. And now you're being restricted to adhere to a certain criteria in order for you to be accepted. So let me just ask you, um, you know, what was, when you're, when you're going through this now in the church, let's, let's go back to that story when you are leading worship now in the church, um, were they used to somebody that was leading by guitar, number one, and were they used to somebody that was writing songs? So what kind of, you you had to experience some kind of conflict or or maybe disagreement of the way that you've done music. What was that like for you back then? Well, this is really before the worship movement started. This is the CCM movement. And I think what happened as a result of the fact that um, that the church wasn't uh, connecting with young young people in terms of in terms of music and connecting with scripture, I think God raised up a bunch of us and we started writing these Jesus. I mean, it was Jesus movement. That's what it right. was. Right. Uh, we were Je- we were Jesus freaks, and so we wrote songs about Jesus. Some of them were worship songs, and some of them were teaching songs. My my calling has primarily been to teaching uh, to to do teaching songs uh but since but but since that time the worship movement started uh i mean i think in 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 some sense ccm sort of failed because it 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 didn't have the worship element that it should have had and so the worship movement worship music movement started and then and and now in some some to some extent that movement has sort of failed uh i mean and I don't want to say it's failed, but it, it is it's not it has not met the needs of the church in terms of providing music that that allows people to to really connect and recognize the worth the, the worth of God. Mm. And um, I don't know. I mean, uh, no matter what we I mean, we're humans. What we do is fra- is is fragile and f- you know, faulted and that sort of thing. But um, I, I do think. The CCM movement was 
too much based on 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 people, on on personalities, on making people famous. And then, unfortunately, the worship movement started, and it eventually adapted that too. And now we have yeah. worship music celebrities. Well, I mean, what is that? Right. Uh, um, right. I think they they got that from us. That's that's my fault. That's our <laughs> fault. That's the CCM, well. I, that's CCM fault. I agree with that statement. And the point is. The yeah. point is, you can sell more records. You can sell more records from a person whose name is well known. That's mm-hmm. the point. True. That's the point. And I, I think there was a whole group of people uh, around your age who recognized how bankrupt the CCM movement was, and they began worship the worship movement. But then eventually, the worship mu- movement became commercialized, and the same sort of uh, celebrityism uh, sort of got woven into it, and uh, okay. I think we—that's one reason why we are where we are. So then, with the commercialization of pastor sermons, also, right? Yes. I mean, I saw a commercial yes. where I thought a—I saw a commercial for a church and a pastor that literally I thought it was going to be a boxing match that I was going to see. You know, they had like the action right. shots of the pastor speaking and um, right. all the flash right. photography and the cut right. shot editing. And I just thought, who, what fight am I going to be watching now? And so, right. and we know where that comes from because that, that comes from a pastor that is seeking the acceptance, that's seeking the power. They are trying to yes. seek their own platform and to make themselves known more than what they're making God known. So, yes. again, help us understand this. How does someone that is in the pews, that is truly seeking God or truly seeking worship, and they have the commercialized worship leader right there, too. And I know, like, yeah. I'm saying this right now, but a lot of worship leader friends that I have will not like my channel. And they don't like me talking this way because they're in it. They may be one yeah. themselves or they may be caught up in that machine and they don't know what to do. So, yeah. Mike, help us understand this then. How does someone stay true to worship amid the unworshipful? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, for me, my, I, I go back to Scripture. I go back to someone like John the Baptist. What does John the Baptist say? I must become less important, and he must become more important. And that's the pattern for, and of course, Jesus is always our ultimate pattern in terms of he emptied himself and he let go of his power. He let go of his authority. Um, um, but but people like that from the scriptures are our exemplars. And um, and I think, I mean, I'm going to a little community church, Fernvale Community Church out in the middle of nowhere. And our worship leader, whose name is Lee, he gets it. And our pastor gets it. And I think they're probably... There are numerically more churches where... where the pastor, the worship leader are are faithful, are acting in, in faithfulness than there are the, the churches that you're, you know, kind of you're referring to where it's all about them. Unfortunately, people want people are attracted to uh, the, 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 the churches where there's the celebrity pastor, yeah. the celebrity leader. People tend to be uh, too attracted to those tr- those churches. And um other than directing people to, to to a different value system, a biblical value system where it's not about us, where worship is not about me. I mean, this, the dumbest, I have, my best friend said, the dumbest thing to ask after a worship service is, did I like it? That's the stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's the stupidest question you can ask. Yes. Right. But but unfortunately, because of because of commercialization and all these sort of things that, again, I'm from the CCM generation. This is all my fault. I'll take. I'll take the 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 the, uh, the I'll bear I'll bear yeah, the uh, I disagree with responsibility because that. that's what we did. We, it was all about us. So here's it's the not your fault. It's what it's what, but it's what man made out of it, right? It's how well, far again, other people kept taking it. Again, if you're famous, I can sell more records. I can sell more of your records. If you're famous, I can get more people to come to your church. And we again, we go back to the scriptures and we see Jesus. Who in Philippians two six through eleven he let go of his authority he let go of all those things uh, and and John the Baptist 
I must become less important. He must become more important. That's the value scriptures that teach the scriptures clearly give us. And, uh, and, and again, I don't want to become just negative about this because I know, uh, I know a number of pastors and worship leaders who, who get this. And so I think to people that are listening to this podcast, I would say, find a church like that, hmm. you know, find a church like that. Uh, Wendell Berry says, you know, you oh, should wow. pick your church. I love Wendell Berry. Yeah. Well, Wendell Berry says, you know, how do you pick your church? Wendell Berry says, go to the church that's closest to your house. And that's what I did. I found this little church that's two miles down the road from where I live in Fernvale. And mm-hmm. lo and behold, there's it's 15, 20 people. It's a, a Lee, again, is our worship leader. He plays a guitar, uh, very much wow. you know, kind of pointing at himself. And uh, we, my wife and I, we've been parts of big churches that have big worship bands and, you know, it's 80, 85, 90 decibels, so loud that you can't hear yourself sing. Uh, in my church now, if it's too loud, I walk to the back of the church and I turn it down. <laughs> we have no sound man in my church. So, uh, yeah, if it gets too loud or if the lead singer is too loud, I just go back to the sound booth and I turn it down myself. So it's That's a so thing. funny. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Now, now that could be spiritually abusive to the worship leader now. Well, but our worship leader, he's fine with it. He's fine with it. He's trust me. He trusts me because because and you know this, yeah, uh, Brandon. When when yeah. it when and it's so when it's so loud that you can't hit, hear yourself sing, you can't worship. You sound like an if old I person. can't hear my. Well, I I guess I do. I'm I'm becoming my father, but I, I'll look whenever it's loud. Yeah. I'll look. And everyone, everyone's reading the li- lyrics and no one's singing. And I go back and I'll turn everything down and all of a sudden everyone starts singing because they can but hear that's themselves. True though, but, that, but that's logistically true. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so what but do you I say? am old and I'm becoming my father. You're right. So <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I feel my father tugging at me too. Um, oh, yeah. So what do you say to those that are hurting in the church from from being manipulated by pastors and even by worship leaders with their music? I, I just say don't don't let those outside um, don't let don't let them spoil it for you. You know, you, you stay connected to Christ, you stay connected to the scriptures. And if you need to go someplace else to find a pastor who it's not all about him and a worship leader who it's not all about him, then do that. That's what I did. Yeah. Uh, and, right. and the too. churches I was going to before the churches where I was going to before weren't bad churches. I'm not condemning the churches I was before. They were sure. just big. And the reason they were big was they had a celebrity worship leader and a celebrity pastor and, and, uh, and they're, and they're good man. The, the last church we were in was in a big church, 6,000 people. And the pastor was a, the reason there were six thousand people was he was an incredible pastor and an, an incredible man. Hmm. There wasn't anything wrong with him. He's a good. He was a good man. Hmm. But uh, the church was just following this formula right. where bigger is better, and um, and so we we just we followed the Wendell Berry formula of uh, go to the church that's closest to your house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, love that, uh, Mike. I have a. Um, Scripture that I always ask people to give their take on. It comes from James five thirteen. It's one of my favorites. It says it, it is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. What significance does that scripture hold for you? Well, I, I, the the psalms and 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 music in general, worship in general, is is the way to stay connected to God. Mm. We, uh, you know, he. Uh, Worship is a response. I mean, God, God seeks us, right? Those, uh, those are the kind of worshipers right. I'm seeking. Yes, I know. Because, You're preaching it. So, in response, in in response to His seeking and pulling and and attracting to me and being beautiful and believable and all the things mm-hmm. He is, uh, I respond. Right. Uh, it's almost like romance. I mean, I saw my my wife is very beautiful. We've been married forty years. The first time I saw my wife and saw how beautiful she was. I sort of responded. It was sort of like worship. Man, I, mean, I don't want to say I worship my wife, yeah, yeah, but I, I just saw it. this beautiful. Yeah, I saw this beautiful woman, and I had to respond. Well, again, when you see, especially through Christ, who God is, 
how much he loves us. He loves me, you know, right or wrong. Even if I'm wrong, he's on my side. Even if I'm wrong, he loves me. Uh, how do I, I've got to respond to that. And I respond by saying, I'm going to give you my life. Uh, and, and worship is, uh, well, singing songs on Sunday is just this tiny little fragment of it. The rest of it is, you know, obedience in the context of my community and caring for people and the poor and, and, and digging into his word right now. I'm, I'm, I'm moving it. Let me show you this. I'm moving into a new Bible. This is, mm. Here's my old Bible on the top. Here's my <laughs> new Bible on the bottom. That's awesome. I'm moving into it. And part, so part of worshiping him was, is, is staying connected to his word. Yeah. And, uh, and a whole worship is a whole life style and i think one reason we don't we we tend to not understand it is that we we say it's oh it's just this 45 minutes on sunday and you know all this you've talked about this probably endlessly mm-hmm. um no worship is this life uh, of res- of responding to the worth of god and and how beautiful he is and how much he loves me and i and i do brendan manning is the one that said you know right or wrong Especially when I'm wrong, he's on my side. Yeah, and there's nobody more worth worshiping than that person. Mm. I mean, it's I that simple. That. I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mike, we appreciate you being with us today. I want to have you back with some more topics, right. and this has been really enriching to hear your your background and uh, just how the the two are coming together today. Because I find it very important for those that are suffering still in ministry, but then that still stay connected, as you say to Jesus and worship. So thanks so much for your time today. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Brandon. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, that was today's confession. And that was how to worship amid the spiritual abuse. Our special guest today, Mike Card, Michael Card. Glad to have him. And uh, we look forward to having you back with us, everybody, here on Confessions of a Worship Leader. Remember, uh, there's no story of abuse that is too crazy. No heartbreak is too much for God to heal. And this podcast is where you, um, you, you're going to hear that you are not alone because it's true. And uh, because your story matters and it's worth confessing. So, hey, if you like to share your experience with us, then please hit me up on Instagram, Twitter, at Brandon Dempsey. Be sure to look out for our next shows and special guest interviews when they drop, when you subscribe to Confessions of a Worship Leader podcast. Until next time, I'm Brandon. Thanks for joining us again on Confessions of a Worship Leader. Remember, no story is too crazy. No heartbreak is too much for God to handle. We are here to help spiritual abuse survivors. Got a comment or an idea? DM us on our socials or text at 512-537-6677. Will you give us a high review and comment on our podcast? This has been a Worship Team Training, digital production of Confessions of a Worship Leader podcast. Copyright 2023. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you again on the next one.